Well, thank you all for your your talks, and we're going to have a little discussion now. And I'm, what I'm going to do is uh, ask a question, and anybody that'd like to start speaking, or if you'd like to follow up with uh, something that somebody else is uh, talking about. But I thought what was interesting about all the all the speakers had uh, sort of a, a view of change. And I'm just wondering uh, what the role of change is in leadership. And I know that um, there were a couple of people that had some specific examples of uh, how important it is for leaders to, to be a catalyst for change. Maybe Roxanne, would you talk a little bit about Well, I think that, you know, if, and it, whether you're talking about, as I mentioned before, your own family, your church, a civic organization, a business, um, that what you're really trying to do, both for yourself personally as well as for those people that um, you are leading, is you want things to get better. You want things to improve. It's a continuous process of improvement. Um, and, you know, some would argue that, you know, that's the nature of leadership that's transformative, that the transformation is both on a personal level as well as within the organization itself that people are functioning in. So, you know, it is the core of leadership. It's the purpose of leadership, which is to bring about the type of positive change that really reflects all of our aspirations and desires. Now, that gets really, there are very practical applications of that, and I think, you know, we heard from other speakers in the context of whether it's a business or the sheriff's department or the chamber of commerce that, you know, there are then specific things that have to happen in terms of how that manifests itself in terms of production and efficiency as well as achievement in me very measurable results for the organization. And it's always uncomfortable, right? <laughs> <laughs> Matthew Kelly writes a lot about being the best version of yourself and uh, along with that idea, uh, he talks about the change in, in these terms. It's not that people hate change, they just don't like the transition. Right. <laughs> And what I've learned, I think, in, in my years is that, as I said earlier, uh, time is the enemy. And we go to bed at night, something happens, and we get up, and it's a whole new, a whole new world. And I, I think as leaders, it's important for us to recognize that we're in constant transition now. And one of the things that, Matthew, things that Matthew Kelly tells us is that you have to recognize that in your systems and talk about it. This is crazy. He calls it crazy world. Today it's crazy world, and when you begin to talk to your coworkers and the folks that you do things with in the community and remind them that we're in a transition, and just about the time we think we've hit a change, there's going to be more transition, and something's going to happen that's going to make us or force us to be more, more nimble, uh, learn how to adjust uh, a little more quickly, but I think leaders have a responsibility to recognize that, that this transition uh, today, more than probably ever in the history of man, uh, this transition is a really significant thing to, to be mindful of. Is, a, is it the role of the leader then to have a vision? Is that part of the change, to, to have some sort of vision that they're moving that organization towards? Yeah, would you like to talk about that? Yeah, sure. Actually, <clears throat> actually we, br we bring it down to the individual in as far as having them be part of that change and to be ready for that change. You know, in our organization, I mean, it's, it's constantly changing and, uh, and they just got to be ready for it. And we do everything we can to prepare them, but they've got to have it in their, in their heads that it's going to happen. So just, you know, be with us or, or you, you know, you got to hit the road, really. What, what kind of vision do you have for, for TQL? What, what kinds of, when, when you first started out, selling produce or whatever how did you <laughs> right yeah so we didn't um, so we thought it would just be the two of us my partner and myself you know in a small office for the rest of our lives um, right. but things just kind of started going we just we started hiring and we figured it out it wasn't rocket science so we started hiring on people and training them and uh, just found hard workers that were self-motivated and really ready to tackle anything in front of them and, and mentoring did you, you talked a lot about mentoring. Right. Was mentoring important for you as a, a leader as well as mentoring others? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, um, the greatest thing about being a mentor is you, you learn as much yourself from mentoring somebody. Um, I j just an example real quick is um, 
one of our young guys who was only working for us for you know about three months, he came in with a black eye. So I knew that you know he's probably at the bars getting you know got a little fight. <laughs> so he came to you know he came to me. He said I know but you know so he explained himself and, I, and he said, you know I apologize for this. I know it's not good, you know good for the company to see me like this. What can I do to change? You know so I really and he asked me for a list for him to what he needed to change to become a leader in the future. Mm -hmm. So he would come back to me every three months and check 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 off my list and add to it. So. I thought that that was a great example of how to actually get from here to here. And now this guy is one of our top 15 people in the company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, great. Yeah. Sheriff, do you think a, a leader is a, a great pusher or a puller? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you have to do both. But quite frankly, uh, the way I look at it is, I more uh, look at things more or less as a participative effort, um, you know, and that's something else with change. The people we're working with today, uh, the workers, the deputies, uh, my jail officers, and I'm sure in the private sector, they're different than they were in the past. They have different expectations. They have different aspirations. Not better, not worse, but different. And you have to, I think, uh, be aware of that. But I, my philosophy is, and I think Ronald Reagan said it uh, once, surround yourself with good people and delegate everything. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't delegate away the authority or the responsibility. But in our office, for example, we very much involve everybody. We're open to hearing suggestions from the troops, even if it's the most uh, junior rookie. And I always refer to my staff as coworkers. I do not like the word subordinates. I do not like to even consider myself the boss, although they recognize I am. The way I look at it is we're all on a team uh, together, and we're all equal members of that team. And I think with that, um, it helps to have that philosophy rather than the old autocratic, I guess you might say, dictatorial type of uh, pushing mm -hmm. that I don't believe the working uh, staff or coworkers today accept. So. That's the way I view it, uh, so I have to do very little pushing. Uh, I tell people what's expected. I have sergeants, captains, lieutenants, corporals that then implement that, and it seems to work very well that way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Barbara, do you think that uh, women are at a disadvantage of being a leader, or maybe there are some advantages to being a woman? Well, one of the dis disadvantages would be having my name pronounced wrong. It's Brenda. <laughs> <laughs> Brenda. <laughs> Just for today, it'll be part. No problem. No problem. <laughs> I think women are just as strong of leaders as men are. I believe that we just need to have that opportunity and the fair advantage. And as far as being able to do things, I don't believe that it should even be Focus, a focus on gender, gender. I believe it should be a focus on what the skill level is and what, whether or not they can accomplish the goal. So I try my best not to focus on just gender because I believe that we all can do whatever we set our minds to do. Do you think there might be some advantages for a woman being a, a leader? Maybe from other roles that they play in there? Is, there are advantages and disadvantages to everything. I, I believe that, yes, there are advantages of women being leaders. I believe that, for me, you mentioned the push-pull. I believe in pulling people. I, be, I really do believe in that empowering. In Toastmasters, there's a program called Delegate, Delegate to empower, and I really do believe in that. And it makes no difference if it's a man or a woman. Thank you. You're welcome. I wonder what, uh, you know, we talk about sort of the, the responsibilities of being a leader, but are there some advantages to being a leader? Are there, I don't know, perks of, of <laughs> leadership? <laughs> 
I think that the, the perks and the benefits of, of being a leader are really uh, around the idea of privilege. Uh, I had a good fortune a number of years ago to get involved in raising money for United Way. It raised about $1.8 million over about uh, three or four months. Uh, that's a custom not only here in greater Cincinnati but across the country. And I remember when I got that call, uh, you're in the queue, Mr. Van Sant, to run the uh, United Way campaign. Um, one of the next three years, and I said, put me down for year two. But I got into that work and uh, uh, met a lot of great people. Uh, I think raised a lot of money for good causes and good organizations. But when I was all done, and and in that process, I had a chance to, you know, to visit boardrooms and go to ball games with folks and, and do the kind of things that it takes to uh, to get things done. But at the end of it, I can remember. Uh, at the finale, thinking about what a privilege it was. And so I think really in leadership, uh, folks uh, is getting behind you uh, and helping support your your work uh, to, to get the accomplishment done. I remember years ago meeting uh, former president of the Senate, uh, Doug White. Uh, and, uh, Doug was from Adams County. And I was there with a student at University of Cincinnati Claremont College who was in political <laughs> science. And I said, uh, Senator, tell this student what you know, what you've done to become president of the Senate, the second most powerful person in the state of Ohio. And he said, well, young man, um, remember this. Uh, one of these days you may get a chance to, to steer the cart. Uh, but before you get a chance to steer the cart, make sure you do your fair share of pushing. <laughs> do your fair share of pushing. Don't climb over top of a pusher, and please don't climb over top of that person steering. Uh, but the more you work to help push, uh, the sooner you will get to the front of the cart and the sooner you will get to steer. So a lot of this is just, um, I guess, uh, the way I started. It's a privilege. Mm -hmm. uh, a, lot of, a lot of other things, a lot of little things happen along the way, but it's just uh, really rewarding uh, when you hit that goal and when you do something for somebody else. It's really, I think, the important work. Sounds like you're very passionate about the, the work that you do. What is the role of passion in, in, I mean, if you, it seems like if you're feeling lukewarm about something, it's very hard to get enthusiastic and actually provide the energy. Yeah, great question. I, I think um, there, there's an amount of passion in just about everything. You just really have to drill into it a little bit. Um, you know, I've learned uh, in, in my work there are thousands of causes, thousands of organizations, all that have you know, good good work to be done. People that are doing good deeds, and and it's searching for the, you know, the positive side of this stuff. Um, there's a new idea out there in community development called uh, affirmative inquiry, and it's looking at the assets that we have in our community. And what do you like about your community, and what do you wish for your community? And I think you know, the passion is is easy for me. I can find that little bit of something that gets me excited about buying a. A, a box of cookies from a Girl Scout. It's just what I do. <laughs> Any Girl Scout in our neighborhood knows you come to my house and he's going to buy a box of Girl Scout cookies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then we give them away. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to speak to that. Sure. I believe in being the leader. I believe the leader can get the job done. There are a lot of needs out there. There are a lot of leaders, but a lot of leaders have their hands tied. If you are the leader and you can make those decisions, then you can reach the goal and you can actually get the need met. That's what I believe. I think the great thing about Toastmasters is that we all seem to be very passionate about what we do and helping others and yes. mentoring. Yes, the service part. Right. Yes, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. What if there are any interesting stories about your first leadership responsibility? Your first, the first time you be, stepped up to the plate, where was it in high school or grade school, or did you run for homecoming queen? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell a quick story. Sure, I've got one. I was uh, sheriff about a week, maybe a couple weeks, and again, I came from the outside. Um, at the time, actually, there were two, uh, I think, sheriffs in Ohio that had legal background: Simon Lee and myself. He's retired, of course, from Hamilton County. I'm the only one left, but I did not come up through the ranks. And I decided to learn the job. I would go out one night on patrol by myself in the Mark unit and see what kind of 
trouble I could get myself into. <laughs> the troops were worried about me. My wife was worried about me. She said, you sure you want to do this? I said, this isn't rocket science. I was out on my own, and a uh, robbery in progress call came out at a restaurant about a, a hundred yards from where I was in my vehicle. <laughs> and I said, uh oh. <laughs> so I did everything they taught you in the academy. Pulled up off to the side where you don't run right up to the front door. Get out and sort of snoop around, look in the windows to see if you could see anything. Every look thing looked fine. People were coming and going. So after I looked like the coast was clear, I sort of eased my way in. And the um, manager saw me. I had my uniform on. He says, everything all right? I said, well, we got an alarm drop, I guess. Uh, that you have a robbery in progress. He says, no, no. Um, we don't have an alarm in here anymore. It was malfunctioning. We had it unhooked. I said, well, it's not unhooked. He says, well, we'll check on that. I said, everything okay? He said, absolutely. And I checked it out fine. I got back in my car. I thought, well, that wasn't hard at all. So I got on the radio, and I radioed into the communication center that it was a false drop, that the alarm was malfunctioning, and they were going to have it unhooked. I get home, and my wife says, well, cowboy, how'd you do? I said, well, I survived, didn't I? I said, there's nothing to this job. <laughs> I'm not home five minutes, and the phone rings. And a uh, voice on the other end says, hey, this is Sheriff. I said, yeah, that's a Sheriff. Who is this? Well, I'm a burglar in this county, and you just broadcast on the air that that restaurant doesn't have an alarm in it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I just may go back there and break in. I go, <laughs> and there was a pause, and then there was laughing. And it was one of my sergeants <laughs> It was on duty that night. He said, Sheriff, next time that happens, what you may want to do is go to a phone, pick up the phone, and call it into the comm center. But don't broadcast it because someone with a scanner heard everything you said. <laughs> and when I hung up, you know what my wife said? She said, you know, you must be a, those men must respect you as a leader because there's not many guys that would call you up and humble you, the sheriff, by telling him, do it this way next time. So I think humility and a man knowing his limitations and learning from the troops is very important also. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. What a wonderful experience. For those of you in the studio, I'm sure that you feel fulfilled that you got up on a Saturday morning, <laughs> braved a little bit of weather to come out here and listen to what our experts had to say. For those of you out there watching in television or YouTube land, rewind, hit play again, rewind, hit play again, and take in some of those secrets. But first and foremost, pick one and put it into action this year. Just one, that's all that's really necessary is one improvement every single year. And as Brenda was saying, in two, three, four, five years, there'll be no stopping you. Mm -hmm. Everyone will sit back and go, wow, look what they've been able to accomplish. I want to thank all of our panelists for showing up today and sharing their experiences. I appreciate your participation and your willingness to do one more thing. I'm sure you get asked to do a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you.